Folks, we're gathered here today to commemorate a very important moment in American history, a moment where we all came together and understood each other, understood the human experience on a deep emotional level. That's right, it is the one year anniversary of Bernie sitting in the chair, cross-armed with his cute little mittens. Tangential and far less important than that, uh, that happened to be at Joe Biden's inauguration, which also makes it the one year anniversary of his time in office. So today, on the one year anniversary of the Biden administration, I wanted to take some time with you to sort of go over his strengths and more so his laundry list of weaknesses uh, to just kind of get a sense of how his first year has been. So to sort of guide me through this journey, uh, I'm going to be looking at this Wikipedia list of the presidency of Joe Biden. Let's get into it. First off, we have health care. Biden campaigned for the public option, but you'll notice that right before taking office, he suddenly dropped the proposal. The public option just hasn't been a thing in Washington so far, and it's different than, you know, things that he's pushed for and just hasn't found the energy to bring to life, which we'll get into later. He just hasn't been talking about the public option. So right off the bat, immediate failure, even before he took office in the administration. He did make efforts to get rid of work requirements for Medicaid, considering his support for welfare reform in the Clinton administration. It's nice that he's uh, not doing that for Medicaid too. And you know, he, of course he has more ACA enrollment period shit, but I'm like, this is just such a compromise on a compromise on a compromise. Like the public option was already a compromise to a true universal system. And then he doesn't do that in the slightest uh, and instead just moves toward more ACA subsidies, which just isn't, you know, a substantive fix. Then, of course, we have the thing that he's currently finding himself in the crosshairs of at the moment, COVID-19. Ole Miss Rona uh, giveth and she taketh away, though it's mostly taking away. Now, he had an okay start as far as his COVID response. He utilized the Defense Production Act to speed up the production of vaccines because it was his goal to get, was it 100,000 or a million people vaccinated in his first 100 days? 100 million people, of course, obviously, it's, uh, 1 million is so little, which is a milestone he did hit, which is great, you know, it's good to have had, uh, especially at the top there, that huge spike in vaccinations, and we saw that up until the, the Delta wave started to hit and now Omicron, it did seem to contribute to a pretty consistent downward trend in the U.S., but then, like a lot of things in the Biden administration, uh, once you get past the first few weeks, it starts to take a nosedive. Like the fact that he, you know, in March blocked exporting some vaccines to other countries, even though, you know, we weren't, we clearly haven't been using all of them. We still don't have full vaccination and there's still a huge segment of the population that is hesitant. We, we had a lot, unfortunately, that have expired. They resisted shipping out extras even though they announced support for waiving patent protections, you know what they didn't do? They didn't waive the patent protections. Now, I could be wrong. That might not be his jurisdiction to write that away with an executive order. That might have to be a stupid thing that goes through Congress. But this is a larger problem with Biden's administration in general, is that things he announces support for, he doesn't put, you know, the, the work behind making happen. This is what you might call a, a virtue signal, as it were. And then we have a, an approach that I'm actually really frustrated with, but it makes sense because he, at his core, is a pretty conservative dude. The way that he's turned the, the lack of vaccination into an individual choice matter, our patience is wearing thin, your refusal has cost all of us, and you know, I certainly don't think conservatives talk about this uh, in a good way either, but I don't like the sort of us or them talk, especially in so far as you, you, there's more he could be doing to make this easier. But in general, I think this individual responsibility talk, as it's used for in a lot of contexts, just kind of distracts from the failures of the federal government and <laughs> doesn't take active steps towards making the situation better 
It just kind of takes a moment to complain about where we're at, which isn't helpful. And then, and this is where I really think he deserves a lot of criticism, <laughs> when Omicron started to pop up uh, late in 2021, he switched right into full Republican uh, states' rights mode, talking about how like the states need to take responsibility and all that. Um, and now you see he's backpedaling with the fact that they're talking about sending out masks and tests. But this is not a hard playbook to have gotten right the first time. We know that Trump got criticized for not sending out, you know, masks and all that, and that he was worried about causing panic in the beginning of all this, and that a federal response would have gone a long way. It's harmful to the people to, to not give them the proper means to protect themselves uh, in a, the, the robust way that the federal government can. And the fact is, we, we had, like with the original uh, Rona strain, we've known some things about Omicron for a while, and these sort of things about the test response could have been fixed earlier. Like, again, he utilized the Defense Production Act to up vaccination rates. Why the fuck wouldn't you just do that again for tests, knowing that testing was starting to become a big issue as the spread picked up? Like, that's just, that's, that's, a, that's a layup, my dude. And then, and I'm not quite sure the extent to which he bears responsibility for this, because I think they're an agency with autonomy on their own, but the CDC changing their quarantine time to five days instead of 10, specifically as Fauci said, because we need people to get back to work. Horrible move. I There are a few things I would have wished he could have done differently than to not let this happen. This is demonstrably damaging. Next, we have how Biden fared on the economy. Early in his term, Biden signed an executive order that removed Schedule F, which meant that the collective bargaining power of federal unions was, was limited less. It also promoted a $15 minimum wage for federal workers and just generally increased uh, workers' rights at a federal level, which is cool. It's nice to see you're using your power where you're comfortable. But again, and this goes into some wider problems with his administration, he's not willing to really press these issues outside of his immediate and undeniable role. He put no effort into pushing to have the $15 minimum wage in his first CARES Act or whatever. He put no effort behind getting the parliamentarian to change their mind or to overrule them to put it in there. And despite the ways that he helps workers' rights where he can, he's not really pushing all that hard for that at a broader federal level. And I'm not saying he needs to executive order his way into making unions super easy to organize and all that, because unfortunately I don't think he has the authority for it, but you know, there are other ways to pressure that he's just really, he seems disinterested in pressuring for the things he campaigned on. And here's a really funny stat. Um, the S&P 500 increased over 37% during his first year, the best first year performance on record, which when you look at how much people are starving and how, you know, backed up the supply chain is, really I hope puts to death the idea that the stupid little green number on the Stock Market Watch website has any meaningful representation to the livelihood and well-being of working people. Can we be done with that? Please, can we be done with this? As far as the economy is concerned, we have the American Rescue Plan, which was his big stimulus bill at the top of his administration uh, to battle COVID response. And here we have his one of his immediate failures as a president, sending out $1,400 checks instead of the 2,000 checks he was talking about. Which I get, it's a cost-cutting thing, and it's possible that that sort of measure was needed to get the mansions of the world on board. This is, again, like, it's just bad politics. There is zero reason to not have put the checks in an individual bill, especially because Ossoff and Warnock made a big deal about the checks. Put that in an individual bill. $2,000 checks, that's all the bill does. Put that on the table and make Republicans vote against it or make members of your own party vote against it and use that as leverage, you know? <laughs> make the people of West Virginia and Arizona angry at their fucking moderate senators for blocking it. 
uh, and then use that to get that sort of leverage, or at least you could say you tried, and the only reason that those campaign promises failed was because of these shitty moderates. But again, he didn't even put the effort in there. It was just like, ah, well, Trump just gave you 600, so you're fine. And yeah, it, it put a lot of money into some other recovery things, like helping schools get going, small business grants, all that. But again, that really nice, positive opening was not followed through going forward. Like, if this robust federal response was consistent throughout his administration, then that might be okay if he kept the same energy, but he has not kept that same energy. And yeah, lest we forget the, the absolute brain-dead state of about 10 months ago when you know, they were trying to talk through the details of this recovery plan and Republicans were talking about Mr. Potato Head and Dr. Seuss. Domestic manufacturing, all he's really done uh, is sign an executive order to support, you know, the federal products have to have more um, made in America requirements, which is, I think, less than the bare minimum considering his support for free trade, for the libertarian economic darling that was free trade in the 90s, he really needs to be doing a lot more than this to, you know, make up for the, the, the clear holes in our production line that COVID has uh, laid bare for us. Then we have his infrastructure bill, which, and I'll put a little link up there in the corner, uh, I did a video covering already if you want to hear my more detailed thoughts on the matter. Uh, but suffice it to say, even though it is technically a very large bill, specifically when it comes to the climate provisions that were cut um, when the effort was made bipartisan, I think it's hard to say that he's really committed to those parts of his campaign promises either, you know? When you cut the majority of the climate infrastructure out of your infrastructure bill, it's hard for me to really get excited about that, you know? Even though, cool, we're getting some bridges fixed that of course, we've needed that for decades. And you know, there's hopefully that <laughs> boosts jobs and economic health and all that. But it's like, it's still, again, it's, it's the tale of never quite enough. Speaking of environmentalism, uh, once again, we have some pretty okay opening week things that then went south pretty quick. During his first week in office, he established a climate advisor position, um, and he also signed an executive order to rejoin the Paris Agreement, which, Cool, great, oh, what's this? <laughs> He's selling off a bunch of oil permits that are going to irrevocably harm the environment in the going future at the same time that he's talking about our need to cut back on carbon emissions. Weird, that, that's a bit of a contradiction there. And again, it's so funny in hindsight that he's like, oh, he puts a ban on new gas permits and then goes to, oh, would you look at that? He's now approving more oil and gas permits on public land than Trump did in his first year in office. Okay, so Trump's last year in office, he did a, quite a bit more. Yeah, literally held the largest federal gas and oil lease auction in U.S. history from the guy who's supposedly trying to be a voice, a smart person in the room for climate change. Oh, but don't worry, guys. He had some markedly small um, wind farms that provide electricity to 70,000 Long Island homes. So really, I mean, you're just being a bit too needy. You're complaining a bit too much. A uh, very brief thing on election reforms. He sure is out there talking about election reforms, but again, he's not using his full weight to support these things he's supposedly in favor of. Like, I'll never forget, like in the negotiations for the initial COVID stimulus bill, Manchin initially signaled uh, dissatisfaction with even the $1,400 checks. Um, and then him or Kamala went on TV in West Virginia and said, look, he's getting in the way of this thing. And there was such immediate backlash that Manchin came out the next day and he's like, whoa, 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 I'm just saying we need to stop and think about it. And he eventually supported the checks. And like, you could easily do that with people now, like, Fucking LBJ got segregationist Southern Democrats to vote for the Civil Rights Act. Surely, Biden, you can get a couple motherfuckers to support some bare bones election reform. <laughs> Then we have immigration. 
Um, you know, day one, he stopped construction of the U.S.-Mexico border and that sort of thing. He withdid travel bans of the Trump administration. But again, it's not a policy that he kept that same energy with throughout because he turns around and using Title 42, a, a policy that denies people the right to seek asylum because of COVID concerns, a thing that Trump started at the same time he was, of course, downplaying the virus. He was blocking people legally entering the country. Um, and Biden's numbers are more. He continues the policy and at various points, um, his like per month or quarterly number of deportations with this rule is more than Trump. Oh, but don't worry guys, he's putting his weight behind removing the word alien and replacing it with non-citizen in various immigration laws. So really, he's, he's a voice for change in Washington. Don't worry folks, we can't forget that he's trying to put Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. He's out there trying to make change happen. Just yet another virtue signal, you know, making Juneteenth a federal holiday, which is nice, but not doing anything to combat the anti-CRT legislation in Republican districts or states to, like, let people learn the true history of Juneteenth and all that. Gonna be honest, chat, I don't know if I have the energy to care about Space Force policy. And then finally, we have how he fared with um, defense and foreign policy. Okay, so here's the thing I actually hadn't heard. Uh, he restricted drone strikes and they hit a 20 year low, which, you know, the, the early stages of those 20 years aren't as big a deal. The, the tech wasn't quite there, but that is good to know that he's pulled it back from, you know, his predecessor's administrations. Uh, he did power through a sale of arms to Saudi Arabia, which, you know, has the worry of giving guns to a, an awful regime. That's never a good thing. When it comes to Cuba, as we can see, not much has changed. Like his previous administrations, you know, he blocked the UN General Assembly's call for an end to our embargo with w overwhelming international support behind stopping the embargo. And then we have his biggest and probably his first hugely controversial choice as president, and that was to withdraw from Afghanistan, or that is to say, to hold up Trump's end of the bargain to withdraw from Afghanistan. Now, I'm not gonna hop on here and say that this was a perfect withdrawal. Clearly it wasn't. I'm sure a lot more could have been done to have more preparedness, uh, you know, rather than having it be so hasty, like you, if you had had more planes ready and that sort of thing, or it started the withdrawal a little sooner so that you can make sure everyone got out and all that. That obviously could have been better there. But, you know, I can't help but feel, and I don't think it's a super great critique on his part either. I think he, he doesn't really give a lot of agency to the folks who, the, the Afghan forces who maybe didn't want them there in the first place. Um, but you know, you, you, if you're a shill like Biden, you at least hope the puppet government you put there would, you know, stay strong a little bit longer. Um, and it's not really his fault that they all ran away and that the leaders, you know, took the money and run quite literally. They had more troops, were better trained, and had better funding. But that's really all you could ask to provide a, a, a government and then if you're gonna, if they're gonna collapse the second you leave, you know, I would argue that's partially on them. But while I do think it's it's rather bold of him to, considering so many other times he's gone back on cam campaign promises, keep up with this one despite the, the clear cost to his legacy, um, it's hard for me to really give him much credit considering one of the main arguments behind getting out of Afghanistan is to, you know, save us money. You know, the idea that, you know, we're spending so much money in this quagmire of a country for literally longer than my little brother's been alive. But then he turns around and passes not only the biggest military bill of all time, but tens of billions of dollars above what the Pentagon said they needed. So it's hard to really make an argument that his decision to leave Afghanistan was based in like a, a desire to save the American taxpayer from supporting this quagmire. So it just kind of muddles the waters there in a way that's frustrating. 
Oh, and before I forget, we have that really fun, really great uh, moment from Afghanistan where they just bombed a random family and tried to say that it was the terrorists responsible for attacking the base, which is very cool. You love to see just senseless killing justified after the fact. Oh, I didn't know this. Another virtue signal thing, but he recognized the Armenian genocide. Cool, good, moving on. As far as overdoing his authority is concerned, we have his uh, ordering airstrikes on possible Iranian bases in Syria, which did not have, you know, congressional approval, um, which I'm not entirely familiar with the legality of that, but it sounds off the cuff like something he doesn't have the ability to do. So, with all this in mind, the question becomes, well, what do we make of all this? Uh, and as far as the American people are concerned, it's pretty clear. As soon as the fallout in Afghanistan started, his approval rating has just been on a pretty immediate tanking with no seeming end in sight, no matter how well he's doing, which is a shame because that really holds back some of his other desires. You know, if he had pushed for like election reform early on and that sort of thing, it's possible that he could have used this period of his presidency to do some okay things. Uh, but now he's just kind of falter. He's just kind of sputtering now. Oh, and I can't believe the, 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 the list didn't bring it up, so I forgot. Um, inflation, which is actually a video I want to cover separately because I think there's there's a lot going into what creates inflation. You know, there's, there's a lot of legs in the supply chain that can cost more money. Briefly mention as an example, you know, if the price of beef goes up, I ask you, uh, what goes into beef costing slightly more money? Is it just 100% purely that there's a little bit more money in the system and that's why beef costs like a dollar more? Or is it the fact that there were droughts in countries that produce beef, um, which not only means water is more expensive to give to the cows, it means it's the, the, the crops cost more money to make because of the need of water, and then the, the cow feed is more, and then you have the fact that so many third world countries, because he refuses to lift the IP protections for vaccines, uh, have low vaccination rates, so they, they, a lot of them are getting sick a lot quicker. You also have the fact that, you know, the American people are finally kind of asking for more money to return to work in the middle of a deadly pandemic. There's an increased unionization movement in the U.S. that a little bit here or there costs more money. All of these things go into what makes beef more expensive, and I think it's intellectually dishonest to just blame it on him spending far less money than Trump did. Um, and it is pretty clear to me that it's in the, 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 it is to the benefit of folks who want to halt all forms of social spending to pin it on him rather than to pick apart sort of the nuances there. But yeah, in general, I guess it's time to, to wrap up by asking or answering, you know, one of the more important questions here. What do I think of the Biden administration? Because of course, that's what we really care about, right? In general, you know, my expectations were pretty low, but I'm severely disappointed even for my low expectations. I think it's safe to say that Biden's first year in office has been defined by a bizarre lack of gumption. Like for all the things that he wants to campaign on or occasionally talk about, he is constitutionally opposed to doing things to make them happen. Like he'll voice support for the largest unionization bill since, you know, the, the New Deal era, um, but he won't put much effort into like making that happen. Like, oh my God, could you imagine if that was like his, other than COVID, his like number one stump speech, dude, if that was what he talked about anytime he hopped on a microphone or was doing an interview? He would be doing a lot better, particularly, you know, I feel like working people would have a better appreciation for him, but he's just kind of like, yeah, I hope this happens, and then he goes to sleep 
yeah, I hope Congress eventually passes this, and then he goes and plays with his dog, and then his dog fucking bites somebody. I just can't think of a president less committed to what they campaigned on, or who seems more disinterested with making things happen than Biden. Like, could you fucking imagine if Trump had this whole thing about build the wall, and he gets into office and he's like, yeah, I hope the Republicans send me a, a, a wall bill eventually. Like, no, he, he took steps, some of which I can't exactly remember. I think some of them were a little bit janky, like using funds from like FEMA and stuff to support um, his weird wall. But just imagine if he was just kind of like, meh. His base would have been so, and even to the extent that he, you know, did what he did, he had people like Laura Ingram frustrated at him that he wasn't doing enough for immigration. And that was after months of pushing for the, the construction of his wall. I, it's just bizarre how little he seems to care and how little he seems interested, especially recently, in, you know, making positive change happen. But, I mean, I think ultimately that's on me for having my expectations somehow weren't low enough. And, you know, I'll learn better next time. Speaking of next time, uh, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel um, because later this week, I'm going to be doing a uh, in-depth analysis. Why should you vote blue? Which is less uh, me answering like in the affirmative question of like, yes, please do. Uh, and more so, I wanna look at like, what literally does the Democratic Party represent? What things do they push for? What reasons do they give a person to vote for them? Because <laughs> I think they're shockingly limited, and I think I just kind of want to unpack how lost in the sauce they've gotten. Or I should say how distracted from providing material relief they have been recently. Recently, it's been a decades long trend, but you know, uh, it's coming to a head at the moment. But anyway, that'll be it for today's video, everybody. Uh, and with that, let's turn it on over to the pre-recorded outro. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to toss me a like and subscribe down below. But if you really want to help me out, you can join me over on Patreon. Patrons get access to exclusive behind the scenes content, like early versions of every video and exclusive Patreon only videos. Plus, if you join the Piley Benton's Biggest Boys tier, you get your name read off at the end of every video. Zoth, Revo Pregame, Emily, Kyle Foley, Jennifer Jones, Caffeine Unicorn, Goblin of the Year, and Cameron Fordo. So if you want to hear your lovely name read off at the end of every video, be sure to join me on this specific tier. Thanks much, everyone, and I'll see you next time.